So now, ladies and gentlemen, live and in colour, it's Mr. Wayne Love Juice. The other day I produced a movie Had a cat with an interesting trappy We said that the YouTube algorithm Really aren't that happy If a channel only broadcasts once a week So we decided we could text ya Whatever we've got A piece of news in our new book on the track extra ASAM, the Association for Scientific Study of Anomalous Phenomena, was founded in 1981 and is generally considered to be one of the most important 14 organisations in the world. They recently had their annual conference and Richard Freeman was there both as a speaker and to cover the event for CFZ TV. Alan Murdy is uh, one of my favourite Forteans and uh, he's a fascinating chap and an old school gentleman of the sort you, you don't get anymore, an old school English gentleman. He's the only person I know that has a monocle which is great. He's a barrister and he's also the chairman of the Ghost Club and nobody more knows more about ghosts than Alan Murdy. Now this gentleman is one of my favourite speakers, uh, Alan Murdy, uh, who's the president of the Ghost Club and he's just given a fascinating talk on supposed demonic possession. And can you tell us a little bit about uh, the talk for the, for the viewers who haven't seen it? Well what it, my talk was an attempt to be was really a review of just how wide the subject is. Uh, it was, I hope, an introduction to the different perspectives on this hugely controversial topic. Uh, so we looked at the scientific, the psych, uh, psychiatric medical approaches, we looked at the more psychotherapeutic th therapeutic approaches, looked at some of the traditional um, religious and um, anthropological views you can take upon this, and also looked at several works in particular which kind of cross over the boundary. A few of them overlap with psychical research. What I'm attempting to say is that on this subject, if one is going to investigate it, it's important not to be too narrow a specialist. You need medical uh, expertise brought to the problem. You need uh, cultural expertise brought to the, the problem. You need uh, people who can at least be open to the possibility of psychic phenomena. You need a caring and counselling role, in many cases, brought to the problem. And there are also sociological perspectives. It is, there is a vast literature, and all the talk attempted to do was just introduce these different perspectives that could be taken to what is a, a issue of growing concern, I think, at the moment. And you find this, this idea of spirit possession in virtually every culture, don't you? Well, indeed. Um, Pre-historic pre societies, pre-literate societies, traditional societies around the world have their own form of possession uh, and also well, often benign. You've got to remember that it's not all necessarily considered bad or, or, or evil. We can even find it in our own culture. Um, if you ask a, a good artist, a good writer, a good painter, a composer, where do you get your inspiration from? You can sometimes get some very interesting answers. They say, I don't know. It just seems to come from somewhere. It's undoubtedly part of the human condition, the belief that you can get information or, or presences coming to you uh, in a religious context. It may be the Holy Spirit, it may be a visitation from God or Jesus or uh, angels in other religion depending on your religious faith or background um, you can interpret it how you wish and equally what I'm, what I'm saying is really there are many approaches to it and if you're going to take an interest in it or try and research it I think you have to be open to all the literature both those who say this is not a real phenomena but also be prepared to read those who, uh, who say yes it is and from that we might 
make some sense of the picture, at least try and bring more light than heat uh, to the debate. One of the most interesting things was um, that the guy who talked about people being possessed by the Osmonds. Yes, this was Dr. William Sargent, who was a pioneering uh, psychiatrist who studied uh, battlefield casualties and what today we know as PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, in the aftermath of World War II. And he effectively examined the situations of soldiers who'd had complete mental and nervous collapses in the fall, in the, during the war, during combat. He found that many of them exhibited uh, symptoms of shaking, of twitching, of un being unable to control their bodies, of talking in voices, talking in tongues, and showing all kinds of strange symptoms previously seen in the literature of hysteria in the 19th century. He concluded that this was a, a malfunction of the brain and central nervous system triggered by stress, and he found parallels in the literature of religion, of anthropology, of all these situations around the world where people go into trance-like states in conditions of stress or excitement or sometimes because of drugs, they effectively break down their bodies, they lose control of their bodies, they lose control effectively of their conscious minds and they exhibit these peculiar symptoms. And depending on the context, they've been seen as possession by God, possession by angels, possession by evil spirits. But he attributed it to the collapse of the, the nervous system through overstimulation, overexcitement, and he even came up with beetle possession, uh, with crowds of screaming um, teenage girls working themselves up into hysterical cases and uh, situations where they happily participated in this because these, these possession states can actually be pleasant uh, for those experiencing them. They're states of ecstasy as well as unpleasant, deeply unpleasant and problematic. And he, he, he became something of an authority of it to the point in 1973 when the American pop group The Osmonds toured the UK. He was advising the Home Office on the problem of crowd control of these, these, these teenagers. And there were serious meetings about the risk of possession by excitement at pop, <laughs> pop music. Uh, that's, uh, that's great. And the other thing that really fascinated me, I'd never heard of before, was the, that book People of the Lie, mm. which I've got to get hold of a copy of because it sounds so fascinating. Yes, this is um, a book written by the late M. Scott Peck, uh, who was a psychotherapist. Previous to that he'd been an American Army psychiatrist and he's best known for his uh, bestseller uh, which is a book called The Road Less Travelled which sold at least six million copies worldwide. Less well known is his later book called People of the Lie uh, which is on the psychopathology of evil. It's an interesting book on many levels. I wouldn't say in any respects you could call it a, a, a perfect book. Uh, it's really a collection of anecdotal observations based on wide-ranging experience over the years. But effectively he diagnoses a type of psychopathology in certain individuals, in certain patients, which he ultimately labels as evil. And this is a psychological category which is not otherwise been formally recognised in mainstream psychology and uh, psychotherapy. But he says there are a very fortunately very small number of people who effectively have this condition which he terms evil. And they, he describes certain characteristics they display in the book. He also explains certain characteristics which uh, go into how you can respond to them and how he had dealt with them in a therapeutic context, which is quite, um, quite useful if one ever has the misfortune to reach or meet uh, any situation where one of these individuals is involved. It's, I, I'm summarising the book greatly. It is wide-ranging. Uh, as I said, it's not, it should not be seen as the equivalent of some detailed academic study. A lot of it is very anecdotal, so you have to be careful with with some of the contents of it and 
treat everything with a cautious in this field with a caution I would say whatever perspective is being taken and also be prepared uh, to be shocked and surprised there are some quite shocking and surprising cases revealed in in this book well he goes on to hint um, and in, indeed admits rather reluctantly that in certain cases this pathology may involve some kind of extra presence, some kind of intelligence, which he identifies as apparently reptilian. And he points to, and this may simply be a piece of um, uh, pseudoscience anthropomorphism, he points to the reptilian element in the brain, the oldest part, what is known as the reptile brain in some um, medical textbooks. It's the brain stem and the oldest parts of the central nervous system in human beings. And he equates that with the coldness of snakes the, uh, and so on. And he actually says, claims to have seen people manifest these features very briefly. Um, set of incredible claims, but he, he was a mainstream psychiatrist and hugely popular author, given a lot of credit in many circles. Um, I wouldn't go as uh, far to say whether any of this is right or wrong. It is nonetheless an interesting approach to what is a very difficult and complex subject. Um, and my, my message throughout on this is try and broaden your mind, not to the point your brains fall out, but be open to all the perspectives. Uh, this, is, this is the thing with such a controversial subject as possession and um, evil spirits and demons, there are many, many perspectives. So if you say you believe in this, uh, I would say read all the medical psychiatric literature read the sceptical points of view, read the views of sociologists who say this is a social phenomena. Equally, um, if you don't believe it, I would say also be prepared to read the religion, uh, le literature of religion, of um, anthropology, uh, because there's many accounts in anthropology of this kind of phenomena, some of which anthropologists say it is a genuine, there are disembodied spirits at work, that's a kind of experiential anthropology. And there's also the literature of psychical research. So don't accept just one viewpoint as being right. Be at least prepared to look at all the others before you form any opinion, so far as you can form an opinion on such a subject. When you actually hold snakes, they're warm. They're not cold at all. Mm. They're actually rather pleasant. Anyway, thank you very much, Alan. That was wonderful. M my pleasure. Well, that's about it for this episode of On The Track Extra. I want to say a big thank you to Alan Murdy for being a wonderful guest. And to Richard Freeman, my old buddy who's there in the corner behind. Wave, Richard, see if it's other arm. Yes, you can just about see him twitching in the corner. That's him twitching in the corner. It's a little old wine drinking, Richard. And... Many thanks to Richard for answering the questions and I'll be back on Saturday. What's going to be in Saturday's show? You're going to have to wait and see because although I have some ideas, I'm not going to commit myself until I've actually edited the stuff. However, I'll be back on Saturday and Richard will be back with me next Wednesday for another visit to the recent ASAP conference. So, until then, be seeing you. Thank you.